Welcome to the Propreneur Podcast, where we help practice owners become better entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Dino Watt. And welcome once again, everybody, to the Propreneur Podcast. I'm excited to have you here listening and watching if you're watching. And just want to say how grateful I am for all of you to actually uh, take the time to learn some of these best practices that we're trying to bring to you through our guests, our experts, our professionals, and helping you understand how to have the best practice you possibly can. Today is no exception. We are uh, excited to have our guest on the show today. Uh, Dr. Chris Teeters, who is going to share with us some really, I think, motivational and powerful messages around community involvement and making sure that you are really diving into, I think, the benefit of being inside of your community and letting people know who you are and what you do. I think most people got involved into what they do because they have a passion for changing people's lives. And that means changing the lives of the people in your community. And you're a big part of that. So excited to share that message with you today uh, with the doc- Dr. Teeters. Before we do, just as a reminder, if you have uh, listened to the podcast before, or if this is your first time and you find any good pieces of nuggets of wisdom that you can use in your podcast and you think that friends, family members, or colleagues can use as well, please make sure to share this podcast with them and subscribe to our Propreneur podcast. So now that we've gotten out of the way, uh, Chris, thank you so much for being on the show. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Dino. Glad to I'm, be I'm excited. I'm excited about it because I've uh, been able to see from afar all the, the things that you've been able to do with some of the, the pearls and, and areas like that. But now uh, there's a few things that I found out through your bio that I'm excited to dig into <laughs> on a personal level. But before we get into all that, please introduce yourself and let people know a little bit about you. All right. Thank you all for tuning in today to the podcast. I'm really excited about this new and upcoming podcast. Uh, my name is Dr. Chris Teeters. I'm the owner of Affiliated Orthodontics and one of the co-founders of Orthodontic Pearls Forum, which is now the largest and most active Facebook group where we have a chance to really um, get together. So I'm excited to share a little bit about that and about some of my personal tips and tricks to better your clinic business and life. Awesome. Very cool. One of the questions I always like to ask, uh, no matter what your modality is, is why, why did you choose, in your case, orthodontics? What, what, what became the calling for you to get into that? You know, it was when I was a kid and I had the worst, absolute worst teeth. Some of them rotated 90 degrees. I was teased about it. Um, and when I had a chance to go to the orthodontist, I always loved to go. I loved to sit in the waiting room. Mm. I loved to observe the way that people interacted. Most kids were thinking, how do I get in and out and move on with my day? But uh, I just loved, loved being there. I loved the physics of how my teeth moved. And, and when I was done, I, I went from getting teased about my teeth to people telling me I had a million dollar smile and, you know, got more attention in the world. And, and it just, it gave me a, a boost of self-confidence. And I want to be able to do that for others uh, the way that my orthodontist did for me. I always love that because there's usually three paths that most people take, right? First is like you and myself too, where like I had the the smile that I did not want to show off, right? I always, uh, all my little school pictures are me smiling really big, but not with my teeth because I did not want to show them. Uh, so you had an experience, right? Some experience transformed you. And then the other one is, you know, it's family. Oh, my dad was a dentist or an orthodontist. And so it's kind of like the generational thing. And the third is I had no idea what I was doing. And then I got into college and I saw this path and I thought, wow, that'd be really fun and went there. And what I love about this first path that I, I like to talk about and what you just pointed out is I often ask uh, doctors as well as treatment coordinators what their ortho story is because I believe it does create this really interesting uh, dynamic between you and the patient of truly understanding and, and getting to that place of, man, I'm going to transform your life and you don't even know how much so yet. <laughs> it's kind of a little secret. It's really That's cool. A big point. Yeah. And I love that part about it. Um, when you decided to get into practice, let's talk about the journey there. So you got in, you went to school. Uh, did you go and associate at first? Did you, what did you do? Well, I uh, met my wife in dental school. We were best oh. for years and uh, she always wanted to be a pediatric dentist. I always wanted to be an orthodontist from day one. And her dad happened to be an orthodontist. And so it was the logical path to go in and practice with him when, when I graduated. So I did not, asso- well, I, I associated with him, but after a couple of years, while she finished her pediatric residency in a nearby town where I was commuting back and forth, it made sense to begin kind of a partnership transition with him. 
uh, mm. to where we're going to, we are going to be partners effective June. And then as he phases out, I'll start phasing in and then become the eventual full owner. And being that it's uh, connected to a pediatric dental office, it made all the sense in the world to have that orthopedo connection. Sure. Kind of sow our seeds there. Hopefully she'll be, um, she'll like your work enough to send you referrals. And that'd be <laughs> <I hope good. laughs> so. She's the that'd boss be... at work and at home. So there I, you go. Yeah, that's my number one goal. <laughs> well, there's an interesting question right there. Um, we're going to definitely talk about the community involvement. I, I, one of the things I love to do on this podcast is just to hear people's stories and their experience, because I believe that somebody's driving in their car right now. It doesn't matter the modality, they're a practice owner. And they might have a similar situation. That's a very unique situation where you're working in the same environment with your spouse. You both are business owners, yeah. bringing that home sometimes and having that conversation. Yeah. Where do you, how do you find that to create that balance between being, you know, business owners, if you will, together and husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend? <laughs> you know, it works out really well. I, I think because she's in the pediatric world and although we share a door, we rarely communicate throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And I do, she's my favorite person to spend time with, but I think with anything, no, no matter how much you love it, if you're around 24 seven, you, you know, it starts to become a little bit less uh, wonderful uh, if it's if a 24 or seven thing. So I think having that balance of her working next door, but we really only confer about cases uh, when she has a question, which is a couple times a day. Uh, there's not a whole lot of interaction. It's honestly not too different than if she worked in another office. Um, although, we, you know, we do do lunch together and, and we spend a lot of time together in the evening. So it's, it is important we have that quality time, but I feel work, we're in such a different mindset that it's mm. almost like a different world with us. And, uh, yeah, that's, and that's we can, great. We can discuss cases and it's, it's nice. Are you guys able to turn it off when you get home sometimes? Like I'm sure there are times where it's like you talk about a few things here and there, but are you able to turn it off and just be boyfriend, girlfriend? You know, we used to. Now that we're moving into being owners, it's a lot harder. When mm. we were associates, it was kind of you come in, you do good dentistry and you go home and you just turn it off and you don't have to think about the management of the practice or you know all the things that go with it but now moving into ownership we're now thinking about well you know is it working with this particular staff member and how can we reach the next level in marketing and everything so mm. i think that now we are bringing it home where before we did not and i think that that's the trade off we have to make when we move from associateship to ownership uh, that we accept uh, it's it's a different stress um, i like it better but it is a, it is not reducing stress being an owner it's just I think transitioning that stress. Into sure, absolutely. Well, I'm assuming that one of the ways that you've been able to uh, relieve uh, uh, some of that stress is through the community that you've created around the the Pearls Group, the Orthodontic Pearls Group, which, as you mentioned, you know, the largest active ortho only, orthodontic only. Like you have to be a practice a practitioner uh, right. to get in there. And it was is it 4,500 people in there? Uh, actually, over. Five now, I think maybe 55. I'm sorry, 54. That's what I meant. I'm dyslexic, so sometimes I, I mess up numbers. So 5,400 people, yeah. Yeah, I, that's, that's been a huge part for us. Honestly, without that group, I don't know really what I do in my practice. It's when we graduate, we're thrown into a world where we only know how to straighten teeth and we mm -hmm. get almost no business training in dental school. Yep. And being able to go into a group where you have these prominent orthodontists who've been in practice for 30 years, who are sharing these things just to give back to the community. I mean, the, the group's entirely free. So it's just, it's just, you know, amazing that people will volunteer their time to share these things. And I mean, you can post a question on, oh, what kind of bonding agent should I use? I've never actually tested this. And then like, you know, you get a hundred responses at the end. Of the sure. Day. And if one of them has 30 likes, well, that's what I'm going to use. I don't have to go to the manufacturer who also right. says, this is the best. This is the one you should use. You know, it's already been vetted through, you know, these 5,400 orthodontists are the ones at least that are participating. And, and you can really just rule out a lot of that guesswork trial and error and just move straight to what's effective. Uh, you can even get personal. A lot, a lot of times I'll, I'll post a question about a staff member and then that'll transition into a private message where an orthodontist will share a, a familiar story uh, or that one that they've been through that's similar and, and has really helped me. Um, I, I'd say it's probably the biggest, the biggest thing that's helped me in practice is that. So the people that are in there are, the doctors are from, like you said, all walks of life from just starting out to yeah. being, being uh, in business 30, 40 years. So you're, it's kind of like your own test market, right? Like you said, do I wear this bond? Do I use this bonding agent? Do I order these supplies? You'll have a ton of different uh, opinions, but you at least get a ton of different opinions. Right. And then you can kind of make a best educated decision. Yeah. And it's nice when you get a lot of, let's say, or even just, I guess in today's version, we say alike. If you get 30 likes on something, then that's generally the first one you'll try. Sure. 
Um, and even comes down to cases. You could show an impacted third molar case and say, I never treated this. What would you do? And then you get 10 different ways to treat it. And then a lot of people would say, oh, hey, I tried this and then this happened. And so you can really just kind of analyze everything and then do the best thing for your patient. So I tell patients all the time, I say, when, when you choose treatment with me, you're actually choosing treatment with, you know, like uh, uh, good point. because we, we all put our heads together. And, and although some cases may be, you know, pretty routine, if you get a challenging case that sure. is very difficult, we really put all our heads together. And uh, we also have this kind of mantra of colleagues, not competitors. And so if there's a orthodontist who's closer, I will send them there. Like my good friend, Andy Sarpadar, that you, or you, uh, uh, yep. uh, one of my best friends, same thing. If they look closer to a surprise, even though it's in my neck of the woods, I, I'll send them to Andy. You know, we're in the same thing happens with me. So there's really this sense of colleagues, not competitors, helping one another. And, uh, and just sharing really benefit the orthodontic profession as a whole. So it really is a community that's a co-op, a co-op, right? A cooperation, not a competitive situation. I love that that point. And and boy, for those of you that are listening, if you are not an orthodontist, uh, please create a community of your own like this. But the fact that you can really, in all honesty, sit and talk with the patient and be like, man, you're not just hiring me. You're hiring a library of information. When you, when coming along with me is, is more than just this office you see, the people that you see here, it's, it's a wealth of information and knowledge that we're going to steer you in the best direction possible. That's, that's powerful. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been wonderful. It's awesome. Um, okay. So let's talk a little bit about you and your journey now as you are this kind of a newer practice owner, you know, I've been working in the practice for a while, but you've already established a way to create that community involvement. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, I think this is a subject that is not talked about as much as it should be. Um, if it is talked about, I feel, and, and correct me if, if I'm wrong or if you haven't seen this as a situation, I feel sometimes it becomes, sure, I'm going to do community involvement so it makes me look good so more people will come and bring me patients. Not because it's out of really a desire to, grow in the community, uh, like to, to give back, if you will. Yes. Yeah. And, and I, you know, everybody has their own motives and I'm not, I'm not judging that. I'm just saying that from what I've been able to see, you've been able to put out there. It's really about, no, I want to give back to the community before it even gives back to me if it ever does. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. We try to get involved locally as much as we can with our local church. I, I play guitar with the local church too. And we try nice. And- it's just kind of a good way to, to give back and, and playing with these um, other musicians and, and helping reach other people to, to find, you know, a good church home. Uh, we also have done things like blood drives and community events where we volunteer time. And, and the motive is purely just, I think, I think it's intrinsic. Like we just, we love to give back. And then what comes out of that a lot of times, you know, people, members of the band or members of the, of the church will come and say, Hey, uh, you know, are you an orthodontist? I heard somebody said there's this, you know, guitarist actually straightens teeth. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, well, I got like this army of family that want to come see you now. And, you know, we trust you and you're involved in the community. And so I think it helps establish a sense of trust. Sure. To do it, whether it does that or not, but it is a nice side benefit that I think goes with, with giving. And I think if you go in it with a heart of giving and not what will I get, it, it works out much better. Um, you know, expecting nothing. I, like I always joke with my, my wife, like I used to go into it when we were newlyweds and we fight all the time. Like how much am I giving? How much are you giving? And mm. we're kind of keeping score. And then, you know, I, I learned this kind of principle of 100 zero where you give hundred percent to her, you expect nothing in return. And then I found yeah. when I was doing that, she was doing the same thing. She's like, Oh no, no, honey, I got it. And where it, it's just a mindset. I think w- when you change your heart, that those things just come, but you don't do it for that. You just change your heart and then everything just falls in, into place. Hundred percent. I have a, a mentor of mine, Joe Polish, who says has a phrase that he uses all the time: "Life gives to the giver and takes from the taker." And oh. if you can just give more, you're going to get more. Um, I don't know this, but you guys have children yet? We do four. Okay, so you have four kids. So it's same thing, right? You were in that situation probably when they were younger of you tallying and keeping score in your head, right? Of like, well, I got up twice last night. Sure. I changed that two diapers and stuff. Yeah. And, and really, the, the symbioticness of a great marriage of parenting is, no, it's, it's just about making sure it's taken care of. Whether right. you've done it 20 times or I've done it three, it's, yep. it's all going to wash out. It's all going to come in the, out in the wash, right? Yeah, exactly. I, we had a saying with our kids, we still say it, even though they're adults, which is uh, when they're like, it's not fair. We're like, no, everything's going to be fair. It's just not going to be equal. Ah, Right. And so I think life is that way. Life is fair. It's just not equal. And that's okay. Like, yeah, I'm not going to expect that. So um, 
Now, how have you been intentional about creating this community involvement inside of your practice? Is it just the, the church part of it with being in the band? Are there other aspects of it? You know, I think my wife and I try to put our, we, we put our heads together and try to think of different ideas as we go. Mm-hmm. Um, mainly it's, um, we need to be more intentional about it. I think if we systemized it more like, hey, it's the first of the month, what's going to be our giveaway uh, volunteer effort this month? or at least this quarter, mm. or it's just kind of come to when we get around to it. I think with the four kids and, and pearls and, and we have a meeting that we do and, and all of that, sometimes we can get caught up in the busyness, but I find that even though we're busy and the practice is doing well, there's still a big part of me missing when we're not giving. So I think being intentional about it is, is my next goal to try to, to actually schedule it and make it a more regular thing. I love that. I love that idea. Um, I, I'm big into uh, taking intention, making it a commitment, um, because it has to start with that intention, with that mindset piece of like, no, this is kind of like uh, my my thermometer setting, right? This is just what I do. I talk about this in sales. I talk about this with your practice. Like, no, no, this is just how we how we are. Right. And now we're going to set the intention to rise that up a little bit. The, the bare butt minimum, if you will, is we are, you know, charitable just in general. Now, how are we going to take that to the next level? What are we going to do? We have our community involvement. What's the next level? Right, right. So I love that around that. How have you noticed um, through the Pearls group, uh, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but uh, have you noticed um, the desire, the almost the, uh, I guess, this wave of community involvement, giving back uh, become more prevalent inside of your industry. Have you it noticed is, that? It is night and day. I'd say the, the most successful orthodontists I've seen without a doubt are the givers. Uh, there, one in particular, Neil Kravitz posts a pearl almost every day. Uh, and he does, he makes them professional. I mean, he takes like, he hires videographers and photographers wow. and, and does artwork to demonstrate how to do this particular tooth movement. And in his community, he's the guy where, you know, someone will call on a Sunday and say, Hey, I have a broken back. He's like, come to the office in five minutes. I'll meet you there. And, and very few people do that. And I think because of that, because he's such a giver, he, his practice has just, just exploded. And uh, I, I've seen that, yes, th- those who give the more have the, the biggest practices from what I'm seeing. And it's a neat correlation. And I think the way that it should be, because you think that the one who's selfish and keeps it all would be the one that would maybe benefit financially, but then have like, you know, not feel as connected, where it seems like the more they're giving, the more that life favors, you know, their, their practice life too. Well, let, let's talk about it for a moment because I can imagine somebody driving their car listening to this right now and they're like, yeah, 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 no, no. My intention is to someday get to the place of being able to give back, right? Um, and yet this great story of Neil of, uh, you know, here you are, you, you, just, you just do it and you do it because you want to do it. Right. And then if stuff is in return, that's one thing that's awesome. That's great. But that's just the cherry on top. The actual benefit is the doing of it. Correct. Yeah. How do you, how do you change that mindset from, well, I'll, I'll do it eventually to no, 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 I'm going to do it. It's kind of like the thing of uh, I'll believe it when I see it. No, I'll see it when I believe it. Right. Right. Instead. So how do you change that mindset? What's it, what, what what are your thoughts or ideas around that? It's a big step in faith. I heard, uh, I believe Tony Robbins once said, if you can't afford to give, you can't afford not to. Mm. If some people think, well, I'll give when my practice reaches a million dollars, or I'll give sure. when I am working three days a week, or I'll give when I reach to a place where I can really, let's say, give a portion of my income back to the community. It's like, well, the reason you, you haven't really reached that is I think you need a change of heart. You need to change the way that you look at the world. And uh, I think just, and make it small. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be a certain amount, but, but give away something, some of your time, some of your financial resources. Um, during one of my interviews, I remember at UMKC, they said, uh, you got to be a giver because honestly, as an orthodontist, you make a lot of money and, and you really are taking from your community. I never thought of it that way, mm. but, um, you know, because I always thought of, uh, you know, you're exchanging for a service in a way, but they're like, but the community is also taking a lot of their precious resources and putting into you. Uh, mm-hmm. so, so find ways to get back because you, you're very blessed that you get to have the life that you live and do what you get to do. So I, I'd like to turn our attention to um, your practice itself and how that's affected your practice because so whenever I go into a practice, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of, uh, I, I just don't believe my job is to go in and say, hey, I'm going to make uh, you a better employee. I'm going to help you be a better employee. I have zero interest in that. I feel like that's just a boring way to live your life. Yeah. But I have all the desire and the focus on helping people become an, uh, better people, elevate their lives outside of the practice 
and sure. then they'll automatically bring that into the practice. Ah, yes. How has your focus on giving back, your focus on uh, community involvement shown its, its beautiful head, I, you know, somebody says reared its ugly head, right? But shown its, its beautiful impact and its ripple effect inside your practice. I think when, even when the staff sees, let's say a letter that comes to me saying, Dr. Teeters, when you did this, this, this in the community, it meant the world to me. And then, you know, everyone sees that those kind of good things, they get a good feeling. And I think it just, the office feeling or the, the litmus test of the office is so important to keep that positive and happy and connected. And it's one of the things I actually personally struggle with because I have this other side of me of clinical excellence. And when it comes to, let's say, talking to a staff member to correct something, being a people pleaser and, and loving people, I, I often find it hard how to keep that happy culture, but also try to work on improving something. Because whenever I call them into my office and I say, hey, we got to talk about something, there's this mm. sense of, oh, well, you're not seeing what I'm doing, doctor. You know, so there's this kind of tension and that tension, then they gossip to the others and it becomes, so, so that is constantly fighting, I think, with the, with the culture. And so I think it's kind of like deposits and withdrawals. Like you need to take those withdrawals to, to make your staff better, but you have to have a lot of deposits too. Because if you just sure. taking withdrawals, then I think you're going to lose staff members, you're going to lose office culture, but you just have to think about pouring into, you know, doing community things, getting invested in, in your staff and, and caring about them and asking about their life and, and doing, you know, little things for them. So you put a lot of deposits and you can kind of talk about things you want to make better. Um, even though they're not really withdrawals, but I think it's perceived that way when you say, hey, I've got to make this better. Yeah. If they have a good relationship with you, I think they're going to want to do it. Whereas if they don't have a good relationship with you, they're going to rebel. Um, like they said, rules with trust builds, you know, a strong practice. But if you have rules without trust or a sour relationship, it leads to rebellion. And then, uh, then it doesn't yeah. work. So, so I've tried to focus on, on more deposits um, so that those, you know, withdrawals and corrected things. Are well, I would even guess that one of those deposits is when they do see those letters come in, when they see the people come in saying, oh, thank you so much for being involved with this you know, hopefully there's that sense of communal pride, right? Like they might not have been the direct person to do it, but because they're in the world of your practice that they're feeling, Oh, look what we did. Right. And that's what we hope right. for is we have right. them that desire like, Ooh, man, that, that elevates me. All ships rise with the tide, if you will. Right. Uh, have that, have that feeling. Have you um, heard of or read the book um, uh, crucial conversations? That I have, and I do have, I have it downloaded actually from Audible, but I haven't. So I'm going to give you the, the, the one minute like summary of it that is exactly, because I know there are guys listening to this going like, yeah, I deal with that all the time. Hey, you got to come into my office. And it's like, oh man. And you're really trying to, I, your heart is in the place of, I just want to help you win in yeah. this game of my business, right? I want you to be the best player you possibly can. But of course, sometimes it's taken as, uh, you know, criticism or it's taken as like, man, why can't you just see all the great stuff I'm doing and not seeing these things that I need to improve upon? And like you said, turns into gossip and all that. It's a great format that they use uh, that I teach as well, where it's the first thing is to always just say what you think they might be thinking about it, the correction, right? So, hey, I don't want you to think that I don't see all the benefits that you bring to our office and how hard you've been working and the tireless effort that you have given to our patients. And then you go into the what I do need you to understand is that I need you to up the game in this area, or we can no longer do this, or I need you to stop doing that. Mm -hmm. But I want you to understand that I see these really amazing things that you do because what they talk about in crucial conversations is you are going into, you're, you need to negate their negative that mm -hmm. they're always going to go to. And they come to. Yeah. Yeah. Like, the, like you're sitting there going like, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not saying that you aren't a good mother. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing right. in this conversation. Right. This is just because of this. So it's it's an interesting thing to go to, but if you can negate it and get right to like negate that, I don't want you to think this, but I do need you to understand this. Yes. And so I need you to do this. It helps with that flow. And that way you can go back and be like, no, 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 because they're going to go to that, right? It's like, but I am a good mother. Well, but I know I just told you, I don't want you to think you're not a good mother. Go back to the thing that I told you about. So uh, just a little insight there on that, but it's a, uh, it's so important. All right. I have to ask you about the band. Yeah. Got to go with the band, man. I, so you and uh, Dr. Neil, as you mentioned, right? Or, or who else was in the band? No, so, Kyle. Yeah. Kyle's in the band with you. Yeah. Kyle Fagala. <laughs> yeah. We have Dr. Cole Johnson, Dr. Chris Seta, and then uh, uh, we got uh, Brian Anderson, who's also the, yeah, the co-founder of the, of the Pearls Group. And it's called Relapse? Well, Relapse, yes. So when's the next album coming out? 
uh, you know, we're not doing albums, we're doing covers. So <laughs> we just mainly want to do a good, what we do is at the meetings, like Mother of Pearls Conference and Orthopreneurs and a bunch of these other little orthodontic meetings that are coming out. Um, we have had a chance to play, be a band by orthodontists for orthodontists. And it's nice. amazing because every single show is completely sold out, 800 or more people. Nice. And, and we're just blown away. The first show, the, the room was filled. And, you know, Cole looks at me, he's like, well, Chris, we have no competition. We are the world's only all orthodontist <laughs> band. So we are <laughs> curious about, like, about it. And, uh, you know, I, luckily we're blessed. Cole is such a, a gifted songwriter and, and uh, showman. And, and every band member actually brings so much to the table. They're all they all could almost be musicians on their own. And uh, what started as kind of just a fun get together has really become something big. And uh, we actually are going to be playing at the AO, either opening ceremonies or the celebration ceremonies, which is the big, the big one. Yeah. 2021 in Boston. So we're super excited for that opportunity. And meanwhile, we're just going to do a bunch of these orthodontic meetings along the way. You're going to be doing some Boston covers then? No, of course. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. That is really cool. What I love about it is, you know, you hear so much about, burnout and overwhelm with doctors and their practices and not really taking time for themselves. And here you've created something. Number one, I think creativity is the number one thing that is lacking in most people's businesses, not just orthodontists across the board, uh, learning how to, you know, play an instrument, paint something, uh, craft something with clay. It's so beneficial to you as a practice owner. Here you've been able to take this, talent do you have have you always played by the way yeah since i was 12. nice so you know take this talent as an as an owner and really expand on it have fun with it enjoy it have something to look forward to it's what everybody needs everybody needs something like that oh yeah yeah and that great to be able to actually do something with it too yeah to create uh, almost a side community in a way and i find that really the secret to life that I found or happiness is, if you will, is to, to diversify it. I, I think people who are workaholics and put too much into orthodontics end up not liking orthodontics. Or if you, if you do music all the time, people, you know, they might think, Oh, you just want to do music. I'm like, well, no, if I did music all the time, I'd probably not like it, but right. if you nail down like four or five obsessions and you spend all of your time on those five things, that family, fitness, music, um, faith, um, you know, and your job orthodontics. Um, you know, I think of, be, feel, feel really fulfilled and not put all your cards into one of those things. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I love it. Love that idea. Okay. Let's ask you uh, quickly. I know we're, we're running close on time, but I wanted to find out, you know, one of the areas we like to talk about when we're dealing, when we're talking with professionals as guests on the show is every business has challenge, every business. I don't care what my business has challenge, every business has challenge. Where do you feel like right now is your biggest challenge that you're, you're learning to or are overcoming? You know, I'd say what we were talking about with, with the staff um, mm-hmm. management in terms of wanting to be their best friend and have a strong family-like culture, but also be the one who has to lead them. Mm-hmm. Um, learning how to become less of a boss and more of a leader. Mm-hmm. Um, learning how to also have them see that I am involved. I think sometimes they see that I am on Facebook a lot doing orthodontic pearls and they look, Oh, doc's on Facebook, you know, and he's not with the baby, he's on Facebook. And I think they see that, Oh, he's slacking or whatever. So I, you know, I invited him to the mother of pearls conference and, and the half that went are, are all behind me. And they're like, Oh, this is the best thing ever. And the ones that didn't are like, well, what's this all about? And right. So, the, so there's this constant battle where I'm, you know, I'm trying to be in so many different places at one time and learning how to singularly focus on just that one thing, and also to develop a staff culture. I think, I think it's hard. It almost feels like something has to give, but, but I don't want it to. I feel like everything can be done. We can have it all, but we've got to, ma- I've got to manage it better, or at least the way that I think the staff perceives it, perceives me and my efforts toward the orthodontic profession and toward our patients. Well, um, I, I agree that being able to manage that is so important. Um, one of the, being a, a person of faith, And it doesn't really matter if you are or not, if you're listening to this, uh, everybody knows the story of Moses. And I use this example a lot of one of the most important things that we as leaders can create is a very specific, relatable and retellable vision for where we're going, right? Mm -hmm. Because man, if I were to take somebody out into the desert for 40 years, you know, at 20, somebody's going, this guy has no idea where he's going. Why are we following this, right? But because he had such a very relatable and retellable and simple vision of the promised land, people, even when they rebelled, he came up with the Ten Commandments. I call them the core values, right? Where we, are, this is what we're about. And if you want to play in this game, if you want to stay on this trip, this is what you do. And I'm right. going to support you in that. 
So using that type of language where people are willing, are able to know, okay, well, where is he actually going? And especially for uh, females, which is very heavily represented in our offices with our teams, um, I, I utilize this a lot. I, talk about, I actually talked about it just a little bit in my last book where I talk about understanding that females want two main things in their life and that will motivate them forever, which is number one, security, and number two, validation. And so that security is understanding where, oh, we're going this place? Like this is the vision? These are the things that you want from me? Okay, cool. That makes me know that you as an owner are giving me security. I'm going to do whatever I can for you. If not, they'll find another place to find security. Right. So uh, you being able to lead them with that vision and that Moses-like, you know, mm. uh, passion is, is really important. And uh, I think most of the people listening to this can relate to that and can relate to like, well, I just, just want them to know I want for their, their good. I want the best for them. And just understand I want to help you get to where, what you want as well as, where, as well as where I'm going. Right. So I'll help out that too. Um, what do you see as, a, as you're out there in the world, you're on this obviously, um, uh, the, the Pearls uh, uh, Facebook group and, and talking to them. If you could narrow down kind of one area that you think is probably the biggest challenge for doctors, whether it be in their community involvement, whether it be in their own personal development, what do you see as one of the biggest areas that you see repeatedly coming up over and over again in, in the Mother Pearls conversation? What I see a lot, uh, you know, a lot of it's clinical forums too, where they're sharing cases and all of that. Too. I think work-life balance is a huge thing. Mm. I think we have a tendency when we are in residency that we're just go, go, go. And that when we get out, there's just a man, like you, you, you study, you take the test and then you get the A. Uh, in pre practice, it's not like that. So there's so sure. many variables, but I sure. believe that if you are still after it and you're willing to put in, in that effort constantly, that, that you will be successful, but it's not exactly as straightforward as it was when you were in school. And so I think the, the biggest challenge that we face now is being able to continue to love what we do, continue to grow in what we do, continue to still be great parents and fathers and husbands. And, uh, and I think what's, what's hard is we, we can give so much love to that new patient consultation, you know, like the mom who is the head of the PTO and has five kids ready to start. You're so great to them. And then you come home and then you're, you know, not nice to your kids or your wife. Like that. Yeah. Like, you're just, you're just kind of a butt kisser. You're just kind of telling people what, what you want. So you get money. Like if you're not, if that's not who you are genuinely. So I think, like you said, taking that time to do what you love, um, doing your job, coming home, being there and present with your kids, and your, and your family and also, you know, with your faith and being involved in the community and the church, I, I think it comes down to a balance almost. Uh, and, and what I've done is I found scheduling is, has set me free where people think, oh, it's kind of making Love me it. rigid. But if you have a schedule and you literally assign every hour of your day, and this is flexible, it can be broken, something sure. can happen. But for the most part, if you have a template on how your day is going to go and you hit those five obsessions every day, you're going to be happy. You're not going to burn out. You're going to reach all the areas of your life and you're going to get there. Where I think so much of us have one obsession, orthodox, or we have one obsession, our wife and kids. Um, and then, then you're not going to be as good as a father, I think. So I think if you find those five things um, or maybe four or whatever, those obsessions and you balance those that, that it's going to work out. I love that. I think you're, you're right on when it comes to scheduling. Uh, I had a mentor once say, you know, you can't steal time. You can't make time. You can't generate time. All you can do is dedicate time. Yes. And that scheduling of time is, is crucial to know that at least at the end of the day, when you put your head on the pillow, that you've touched those four or five areas that you talk about. And they're all personal to everybody. I loved your uh, outline of those. And I think that's a great place to start if you were to look at, so you said spiritual, or no, you said faith, finances. Yeah, faith, family, fitness. Fitness. Music, or Music. Pastors, and orthodontics. Orthodontics, uh, your, your job, if you will, whatever, your yeah. career, yeah. yeah. I think anybody listening to this, if you were to just take those five areas and literally put them into your schedule of an hour a day, uh, 20 minutes a day, an hour a week for some of you, an hour a month would be good right now uh, to yeah. really keep that balance, right? To, to have that, I think that would be huge. And one of my goals on this podcast is always to give those little best practices that I think can help out 
just a little bit. I'm not asking for the whole pie. I just want a slice of it. And then we can work on the rest of it later on. So that's awesome. Okay, we've come to a portion in our show where we ask our rapid fire questions and we get rapid fire responses back from you. Are we willing to play? Sure. Awesome. Cool. The first thing I want to know is um, what is the number one thing that you wish they would have taught you in school? How to run a business. We get out, we do not know anything about the business side of things. So uh, I don't even know what my financial coordinator does. I don't know how to keep a checks and balances on her. I just trust that the books are, are good. And uh, that's uncomfortable to me. Uh, sure. to have the ability to essentially know each aspect of the practice and only really the orthodontics. So I wish they had taught us more about that in school. It's the reason why I created the name, uh, trademarked the name, created the podcast with the propreneur because that professional entrepreneur, right? Here you are, you have this professional degree and you're forced out there to be an entrepreneur and no one taught you how to be an entrepreneur. And by the way, not everybody should be an entrepreneur, but yeah, it's crazy. What's a book that you feel every private practice owner should be reading? Uh, Grant Cardone's Be Obsessed or Be Average. It's, oh, uh, really? I love it. Successor to the 10X rule, but it just, it lights a fire under my butt every time I read it. Uh, the whole principle being like, you got to define your life or someone else will define it. You need to basically get obsessed with, like I talked about those five things. If you have and multiple obsessions, find yep. things that you're obsessed about and get obsessed, eliminate everything that doesn't fall into it. Watching YouTube, sitting there on Facebook, you got to eliminate that, put all your time into your obsessions. It's just such an inspirational book that I highly recommend it. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. Grant, Grant Cardone has not been brought up in this. Uh, so he's <laughs> a lot of people are hot, hot, hot or cold on him, but I think sure. that is, and he's fascinating and passionate about what he does and he's getting results. So that's awesome. Yeah. Well, speaking of books and in my book, the practice RX, as you know, I really focus a lot on team culture and team performance as the foundation for any business growth. Doesn't matter where you are, what business you're in, but as somebody who gets actually kind of a, an inside view, if you will. Uh, you get to watch what's going on on your, on your uh, Facebook group, also with other colleagues that you have. What do you feel like is the biggest challenge private practice owners are facing right now when it comes to their team and their office culture? I would say, again, the balance of maintaining the office culture and achieving orthodontic excellence. Hmm. It is a balance, right? I, I liked what you said earlier too about how, you know, I, I want to be their friend, but I'm also their boss. How do you have that, it's a gray area, right? That you have to understand the same thing with that balance of being great and, and excellence in what you do, but also letting everybody really enjoy it and, and have fun there. Exactly. Love it. Uh, before we get onto the last two questions, how can people reach out to you uh, and connect with you more? Oh, sure, they can reach me anytime at christeters at gmail.com. I check my email regularly throughout the day, so that would be a great way to get a hold of me. Awesome. I would also put out there that if you are an orthodontist, go check out the, uh, is it, it's not Mother of Pearls group, right? What's it called? Uh, so Orthodontic Pearls is the group and the Mother of Pearls conference is the meeting that we're having. There you go. September. They're both there you on. go. Reach out to them, uh, and see how you can get involved. And remember, give to the group, right? Don't just go in to take, like you can give wherever you are right now in your practice, whatever you're doing, you have wisdom that other people need to hear. And they need to hear your voice. Your voice matters in that situation. Um, next question is, what's the best advice? And this is a big question, I know, but top of your head, what's the best advice you've ever received in life or business? Uh, schedule and manage your life or someone else will do it for you. Nice. I love it. Uh, be, make a choice or be compelled. That's it. <laughs> so that's awesome. And lastly, what's the best resource or tool that you feel you've used to grow your practice? Without a question, these Facebook groups, most of all uh, the orthodontic pearls to have those mentors in the palm of my hand. I mean, we could be at a park and I can have a question pop in my head and right there have orthodontists ready to share. So it's been the number one resource uh, for sure for me. Wow. Um, the thing that just kept popped in my head as you said that is, I know there are guys uh, and gals out there listening to this um, that feel alone, that feel like they are this island and they don't have just anyone to listen to, whether it be a parent or whether it be another colleague. They're living a life in, in secret. They don't have anybody to go to to say, dude, I, I don't know where payroll's coming from this Friday. Uh, I, don't, I don't know uh, how to talk to people, talk to my spouse about my challenges inside of my business. And what people need is a community. And what you've built is a community. And I think it's such a gift to people that hopefully most people in that uh, community realize it. Uh, if not, they will. 
And I just want to thank you for being a part of that movement and, and sharing that with everybody. I think that's amazing. Absolutely. I love it. Love the, seeing everyone come together. It's great. Well, Chris, I, I just want to, I, I hate these things coming to an end because I feel like I can talk to people forever about their <laughs> businesses and about what they're doing. And, and I just want to thank you personally for being a guest on this show, for sharing that wisdom with those that are listening. And like I said, the great thing about this podcast is we share it with whether you're a chiropractor, a dentist, a, a, an orthodontist, a plastic surgeon, ear, nose, and throat, doesn't matter. If you have a practice, you need to find the best practices out there to help you and know that there's a community for you. And you've definitely added to that this, this uh, episode, and I really, really appreciate it. Appreciate your time and your effort and your energy and all that you're doing. Thank you, Dino. Thanks for having me. This has been a blast. Absolutely. And for those of you that are listening, don't forget once again to subscribe to the podcast and to share it with a friend or a colleague. Reach out to Chris, reach out to our other guests that you've heard is all of the information, all the links that he's talked about with the books and everything will be in the show notes uh, that will come out when the show is produced. And again, everybody, our whole goal and effort here in the Propreneur podcast is to help you be more productive in your life have more, uh, um, be more proactive in everything that you do and have more profit in both your business and life. And thank you again for listening. We'll see you on the next episode. Thanks so much again for listening to the Propreneur Podcast. We really appreciate your support. If you haven't subscribed already, please make sure you do so. Also, if you feel like you might be a good fit for our podcast as a guest or know somebody who you think would be, go ahead and email us at dino at dinowatt.com. Again, thanks for support. We'll see you on the next episode.